I'm Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast. And I'm here with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre at Nutmeg Post with Frank Verderosa. Our guest this week is an accomplished musician, singer, and a celebrated stage and screen actor who's appeared in films such as All the President's Men, Dog Day Afternoon, and Justice for All, Unfaithful, Night Falls on Manhattan, and as Hyman Roth's right-hand man, Johnny Ola in the classic Godfather Part 2. TV shows include Damages, Blue Bloods, Boardwalk Empire, The Good Wife, and he'll forever be known to audiences for his Emmy-nominated role as the senator, manipulative, and often hilarious Uncle Junior on the iconic HBO series The Sopranos. Please welcome the pride of Archer Avenue right here in the Bronx, our friend, the multi-talented Dominic Chianese. Oh, we got it. I got it. <laughs> we have it. I'm telling you, like, it, people don't realize up to uh, three seconds before I got on the mic, I was asking you, how, how, what's your last name again? <laughs> <laughs> you did it. Yeah, very good. You, you forgot it. I love it. I forget it myself sometimes. He's uncomfortable. He's surrounded by Italians, Dominic. Yeah, oh, Roberto Rosa, that Santo Padre. Yeah, see, He's got to go on Arthur Avenue. Then. Yeah. See, I, I wanted to make this show more Jewy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's a lot of Italian expressions that are like Yiddish. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, for people out there in the audience not familiar, mm -hmm. uh, if you're a Godfather fanatic like we are, in Godfather 2, there's a scene where Johnny Ola takes Michael and Fredo Corleone to, like, basically a live sex show in Cuba. And there's a guy playing there named who they called Superman. Right. And <laughs> and at that point, there's one point where uh, John Casals goes, Johnny Ola knows this these places like he knows the back of his hand. Right. And that's how Michael realizes right. Fredo was in on the plan to assassinate him. Right. And so that that's just one of those great scenes. That wasn't me, Superman. I wasn't there. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was me. Yeah, but Johnny Ola's not in the scene. He's not? No. Everybody no, they refer so, to Johnny Ola. They refer. They yeah. refer yeah. to yeah. Johnny, Johnny Ola. Johnny shows him the place. The scene, but yeah. Yeah. I think jo Johnny oh. Ola turns Fredo on to that place. Of course. Yeah. Right. And he says, oh, man, Roth would never be caught dead that's in a right. place yeah. like this. Yes. And that's right. what Michael overhears. Yeah. 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 Oh, that was a great show. I now, call everything a show, you know, but a great film. And if, if, if anyone wants a letter of recommendation uh, for Dominic's acting, a Al Pacino has used you in at least four of his movies. Yes, Al was this, Al introduced me to, because uh, I knew Al from stage, from the stage work, and he introduced me to Sidney Lumet, and Sidney took one look at me when I was, let's see, 1975, I was 44 years old. Well, I was right after The Godfather. I met Sidney after The Godfather, I got that wrong, but Al introduced me to Sidney, and then I did some movies with Sidney that Al was in, like In Justice for All, was that Norman Jewison did that. And then... Uh, Dog Day Afternoon. Let me put it this way. Al introduced me to Sidney because then he did do Dog Day Afternoon, right? And he saw, he saw me as the father with that great line, you know, I rob a bank when you got a sucker for a mother. Mm -hmm. That's a great line. They don't write good lines like that too much today. Yes, they do, actually, yeah. But he... Then, so he... Al, Al was a great force in my life, a great, great... Uh, he was like my godfather to me, that young man. And he's younger than me, you know, much younger. And speaking of Pacino, tell us about when you were cast in The Godfather. You tell a story, and there's an interesting story you have on your website about the scene. How, oh, oh, how yeah. Co well, Coppola kind of made you anxious on purpose? He, yeah, he got me very nervous because he knew that I was a stage actor. I had never done any films. 
I had a walk on once with a line in a dark in a, in, a, in, a sh- in a movie shot in Boston, <laughs> you know, and I recognized my voice, but you don't see me. So I never really did any acting on films. Mm-hmm. And he saw me. He, I think he knew that I was going to try and nail it as an actor. And, of course, I didn't know about the camera and that it doesn't lie and all that stuff. So I probably went there with the intention of acting. And he nailed me right from the beginning. He said, Dominic, change this, change that. He got me very nervous. Because you had memorized everything you came in with. Of course. With. And I was start- ready to, you know, to be, uh, you know, whoever. Ready to, to really be like Earl Flynn doing an uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> It didn't work. It didn't so work. He, he threw he, he you saw, off. He saw it right away. He threw you off intentionally. Oh, definitely. I didn't know that, though. Yeah. And I was, I, then, the third time he threw me off, the third time, uh, and, and I really started getting nervous. I'll get up out of his seat and ran over to the back. And I remember going through my mind, oh, this is the end of my movie career. <laughs> In my, with this one shot and that's it. And Al came back and he said, uh, and I said, Al, I'm sorry. I, I, he keeps changing. The, I, I'm sorry. Al put his hand on my, my arm. I'm He said, Dominic, Dominic, it's not you. And then I got it. Then I realized what he, he, he was manipulating me. Uh-huh. So then Arthur Avery and my Bronx came out of me and I said, that son of a bitch. I didn't say that, you know, but to <laughs> myself I said it. So I saw the communion kid coming over his shoulder with the, with the bow and I went like this. And he goes, that's too much, Dominic. I said, uh, so I was testing him, see if he was watching me. <laughs> then I realized, wow, this is great. You don't act in front of the camera. Even just moving your eyebrows and making oh, that I gesture just was hardly too much. like a, a millimeter of an inch. Interesting. So they kind of tricked you. He, he and- got me got me to the point where I was there in the studio. I wasn't acting. I was really being Dominic, playing Johnny Ola. You know what I'm saying? There's a, that's a, a, good, a good device because that's what movie actors have to do. Uh, they have to be so relaxed, that, uh, you know. They have to, they have to be so sure of their, uh, of their inside technique, so I, so confident right. that they can just be themselves. Uh-huh. I think I don't know if uh, Jack Lemon said I don't know if it was Billy Wilder mm-hmm. or something, and he kept saying, oh, "Okay, uh, no, 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 cut, do less." And then do less, and then do less, and then Jack Lemon got angry, and he said, "He goes, if I do any less, I won't be acting at all." And Billy Wilder goes, "Oh, thank God!" (laughs) (laughs) Very good, yes. And the great Lee Strasberg said the same thing. No acting, no acting, yeah, no acting. No. uh, Tell us about Lee Strasberg. Lee is Lee. Lee was like a you'd say like like your grandfather, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were sitting in the car one day, and uh, we were dri- we're on a set in Cal in California. No, I'm sorry, we're on a set in uh, in Santo Domingo, and uh, he's driving the car, and I was sitting next to him. This is the kind of guy he was. I'm saying, and my wife and his wife were in the back seat with all the little kids. I had my little boy. Alex was two, and his two two adorable sons too. I mean, he's a nice kid. They're all two years old. So I'm sitting in next to him, and he's driving the car. And, you know, he plays Hyman Roth, and I'm Johnny Ola. He's my, <laughs> so he's so he's <laughs> driving the car, and one of the kids, say, I'm hungry, mommy. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. So I turn, I'm Dominic, and I'm making a joke with my family. Then and Lee looks at me like, "You're Johnny Ola," you know, as if to say, "You're John. You're not Dominic." <laughs> I said, this guy's so serious. He's very serious. And then we go to this big feast. We go to this big feast, you know, because I had a baby born down there. We, had, we go to this big feast where all the, all, all, the, all the wonderful Dominican people are giving us food and they're talking about it and everything like that. And, and Mr. Coppola is saying, Dominic, sing him, an, sing him an Italian song. I said, I don't feel like it, uh, 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 Karma. I, 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 I ate too much lasagna. You know. He said, nah, sing something. I said, all right. Sotto il manto di stelle, and I do a guitar romana, but I do it half assed because I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was so full. I didn't feel, so we walk out, and, and he taps me on the shoulder. This guy, Lee, he said, You could have done that better. I, I wanted to grab <laughs> I wanted to choke. But I loved the guy. But I loved the guy. He was a great man. He was always teaching. That's, so, that's yeah, Lee. Of course. What, what are some of the things Lee Strasberg taught you? He taught me about uh, that the voice, you can tell by the voice, because he took me to his apartment one day, and he, he, he showed me a lot of singers. He knew I'd like to sing. He just showed me that you can, the voice tells the truth. You know, uh, Willie Nelson's great uh, thing about music, three chords and the truth. You know what I'm saying? Well, I like that. Yeah, it's, I it's heard that's great. It's about the truth. And the voice shows that, and that's true. And that's why, that's why 
that's why Coppola always, you know, manipulated me with love there, you know. Did he watch you for the first Godfather movie and you were doing a play? I mean, he could have. Oh, yeah, I think he did. Yeah, he told me that he did. Uh-huh. But I was in Boston and I didn't have any money. I had to borrow money to get to Boston. I, I wasn't, you know, they weren't going to send a limo. Over. Right, of course. <laughs> Here's a question I had about the business, right? <laughs> One yeah. thing I wanted to ask about Johnny Ola, and you, I, I saw you, uh, I saw an interview with you, and you were talking about how many takes it took for Michael's bodyguard to choke you. Yeah, okay, with the hanger. Yeah, with the hanger. With the yeah, clothes. If you look real close, that hanger slipped too. If you uh-huh. look real close at the thing, the hanger slipped away because it was it was a wooden hanger, and 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 he had me around it. Now Francis in the, in the script said it, he dies like a snake, so he wanted my head to go like a snake. I said, "You're crazy. I can't do that." You know. He was never happy with it, but he did it 11 times, and I had a sore neck for about a week. Because the guy was short, too. He was considerably shorter. A little than shorter, you. not too much. Yeah. A little shorter, but he had big hands. God bless <laughs> he him. He was a sculptor. He was a teacher yeah, of sculpting. a Hungarian sculptor. Yeah, he used to strangle the uh, – uh, he was in the underground in Hungary and Italy. He would strangle uh, the, the enemy. Really? Oh, yeah. wait a, a second. Amerigo Tot. Is that his name? Tot. Tot. T-O-T. Amerigo Tot. So, he was in the underground. He told me the story. Fascinating. He, he would strangle Nazis? Yeah. This is better than than everything I'm talking about acting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's such a scary looking guy. Yeah, you but know. he was really a really a swarm uh, individual. So An he artist. would choke Nazis yeah, his with hands his bare hands. Big, I have small hands. My grandfather was a stonemason. He had big hands, but this guy's hands were even bigger than my grandfather's. I so small hands. he knew what he was doing. Yeah, he was in the underground. He told me. He told me about that. I didn't, you know, ask yeah. him to do too much. We didn't talk that much. But when he did, we got together a few times because Al got sick. You know. And then we went to visit him in the hospital. Al had a touch of emphysema for about a week, held up the movie. That's why my baby was born. My wife was pregnant at the time. And uh, a lot of things, wonderful stories about that. But Marigo was, was, a, was in, the, in the underground in, in Italy and Hungary. Yeah. I assumed he was Italian all these years watching uh, the film. Yeah, and then I did a Roman. little research. Yeah, he was a Roman, I think. A sculptor. Yeah. He died about 10 years ago, yeah. I think. He's yeah. a lovely man. Now, here's a weird thing I found out that I was, I must say, I was very disappointed. You are not born in Italy. No, I'm born here in the Bronx. My father was born <laughs> in the Bronx. My mother was born in Brooklyn. My grandfather came from Napoli. Yeah. yeah. That's because I sing Italian like a real Napolitan. Yeah. Uh, now you, you, you understand it, but you don't oh, yes. speak it. Uh, I understand the lyrics when I'm saying yeah, okay. it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Te vego, te sendo, te so on. You know, all that stuff I understand. That's not really done. Right. And my grandfather was very close to him, and Neapolitan was my first language as a baby because that's all I would hear. They'd be screaming at each other in Napoli, you know, you're in a car, watching, you know. All so, stuff. like me, your parents are first generation Americans. Yeah, but they talked Italian. They spoke Italian with, mm-hmm. their, with their parents. So, I remember Italian and. Uh, and as a child in school, I knew the difference between calm breezes blowing and sul mare lucica. You know, I had a good ear for music. For, so. Gilbert wasn't listening, but I want to repeat the story that, it, yeah. that I was telling Dominic out by the kitchen. Oh, I, it's I never listen when of you talk. Of course you don't. Dominic, Dominic was <laughs> in a right, player. Very close <laughs> yeah. bond here. He was in a play early in his career called Love, L-U-V. Right. Yes, or she's got written oh, by yeah. written by the great playwright. That, that was uh, made, that was a Jack Lemon made into a yeah. movie with Jack Lemon and Peter. But Falk. the play is hilarious, and yeah. I yeah. played the funny guy. You know, I forget his name. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, written, written, Murray Shiskal wrote the the play, and and yeah. uh, Dominic and I were talking. Murray Shiskal was a grocery boy as a as a kid oh, in my right. grandfather's grocery. Oh in Brooklyn. wow! In, in yeah. Brooklyn, yeah. Wow. He's still around, Murray. We should get him on and talk about Tootsie and some of the Your stuff daddy he wrote. Or your grandfather? No, my grandfather's gone, but Murray's around. Oh, he's still on. Yeah, yes, I know. Yeah, he and Dustin yeah, Hoffman have a company together. Yeah, I loved that role. I mean, it, it was made for me. I, I, at the time, I was. I did it. I think I was uh, like thirty-seven years old. I was out of high school twenty years, but but I really loved that role. And we did it in dinner theater. People were laughing so hard. It was a funny, funny role. Oh, and tell us the story about how you first got into show business. Um, yeah, my first professional job. Right. Yes. Uh, my father was a bricklayer. He was a bricklayer foreman, and we were leaving Arthur Avenue one morning, and we're heading toward New Jersey. But it was a bus filled with bricklayers, and uh, and I saw an ad in the paper that said singers wanted 351 East 74th Street, Jan Hoos Church, for Gilbert and Sullivan. And I had just come from Champlain College, where I had done an understudy as a chorus boy for one of the Gilbert and Sullivan operettas. So. That struck me. I said, gee, maybe I'll get off the bus. And I, 
And, and Mike, my cousin Mike said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to go talk to my father, who's a foreman, sitting in front of the bus, you know, like, like a foreman does, and with his arms crossed. And, I, uh, and it took guts because uh, I had to ask my father, whom I knew didn't want me to be a bricklayer, but I did it anyway because I loved my, my father. And I wanted to be a bricklayer for him just to please him and to prove that I could, I could do it, whatever. I had an attitude as a kid. Who doesn't, right? When you're sure. Italian, we have big attitudes. <laughs> And so, <laughs> so I said to my father, I said, Pop, can I get off the bus? He looked at me like I had asked him, you know, that, that, like the bus is going to blow up or something. He said, what? <laughs> w- what for? I said, for an audition. What's that? <laughs> I said, for singing. And there was a pause of about five seconds. For singing? Mm. Okay. So if I said for acting, I wouldn't be here now. But I said for singing, and he knew that I loved to sing. He would always force me to sing as a child. They would, they would practically for him. Come on, sing, Dicky, Dicky. That was my name. Come on, Dicky, sing, sing, sing. So I was singing all my life, and he liked to croon himself, his mm-hmm. brother, because these were the days of the the big bands and all croonings, you know. And he he singing. All right, go ahead. He figured maybe I'll come back the next day. I never went back to Brickland because I walked into Jan Hu's church and Dorothy Redlick walks over to me. She was a very tall, imperious-looking woman who spoke very beautiful. She says to me, young man, have you ever done Gilbert and Sullivan before? And I said, yeah, yeah. I, I understudied the Duke of Plazatoro up in Champlain College. She says, you mean the Duke of Plazatoro? And I said, yeah, that's what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> so she starts laughing. She said... Do you know any Gilbert and Sullivan song? I said, well, you know. She says, what, would you like to sing some? I said, yeah. She, so she sent me down to see Rue Knapp, who's down, way down by the stage. And uh, Rue says, what are you going to sing? I said, you know that old devil moon? <laughs> <laughs> so you remember what your audition was? Oh, sure. Yeah. So I said, I looked at you, and I did the whole thing. Suddenly, something in your eyes. I said, I don't know who I was I imitating. I was trying to be a singer. And she comes walking down the aisle, and never forget, she looks at me, and she says, you're a diamond in the rough. That's what she said. That's <laughs> great. She was a diamond in the rough, and she said, come back tomorrow. And I came back, and I got in the chorus. I was 20 years old, and I, and I loved it. You know, I loved it. So when your father let you off the bus, that was, it was, was it kind of like, eh, he's being an idiot. Let him do it and he, well, get it out yeah, of the Yeah, no, he knew that I loved to sing. Yeah. And he knew that if, 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 if he said, get, he didn't, first of all, he didn't want me to be a bricklayer. Yeah. Because I, I could be, I could lay brick in a line, but I wasn't meant to be a bricklayer. He knew I didn't have that kind of mind. I didn't, I'm not a mechanic. Like he was, he was, he was an expert yeah. mechanic. He had guides on brick laying, all the, all the beautiful bricks you see in New York, all that thing. He, that was his trade. He was built know? that way. And he knew I wasn't, he was built that way. He was a mechanic. Uh, and he knew that. So I think it was like, let him go. Maybe he's, you know, but he didn't yeah. think I was going to get a job, but I got $110 a week. On that and did you run? Didn't you? Come that was home a lot of money sh- in 1952. Yeah. <laughs> I'll bet. Did yeah. you run home and show him the money and show yeah. him the check? And uh, no, I went home. My mother and my mother had to come down and sign because I wasn't 21. Oh, yet. I see. So she got me. And the next thing you know, I was on the road with these guys. Wow. And then the story goes on from there. But uh, but if you'd said acting and not if I had singing. said well, I wasn't an actor then. I was really uh-huh. a singer uh-huh. who liked to act. You know, I was really a singer. I, th- I wanted to go into showbiz. I wanted to go into radio actually. I always wanted to be into. I always liked the idea of being in a studio, and and Pop loved me. And he, and uh, when I think about the story about he spent like eighty bucks one time to to get me a, a, when I was sixteen to bring me downstairs, and uh, the whole thing didn't work out. And I felt bad, you know. But he was a, he, you know, he, of course, my mother was, you know, she, I could do anything. My mother thought I was a prince, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what got me in trouble. Because when you're the first child, I was the first child, Frank. First child, Gilbert. The yeah. first grandson, both sides of the family. I could do no wrong. I also heard you say Italian. Most Italian boys are looking for their mothers. Oh, which yeah. Which I find was true. an interesting, yeah. an interesting comment. Because they, we got so many mothers, aunts, cousins. Mm-hmm. All, I mean, they all kissed me. <laughs> I had so many kisses when I was a kid. <laughs> I, thought I, was, I thought I was Prince Charming. Yeah. <laughs> I had an Aunt Rose like you, too. Huh? I had an Aunt Rose like yeah, you. Yeah, I had like an Aunt did. Rose. I yeah. mean, you could do no harm. You could, I mean, if I shot the Pope, my mother said he deserved it. <laughs> That's a great line. God forbid. God Bill, forbid. did you ever go to your parents and tell them what you wanted to do? Jewish I'm mothers curious. are the same. They're the same. Jewish yeah. Mothers. Did you have they to? They love you. <laughs> He's got a point. I, 
I think they uh, I, I'm sure they probably thought it was absolute insanity. Like I'm sure in, in their minds, and it, you know, it's funny. Oh, that funny. we wanted to be yes. performers. When I think about it oh, now, yeah. well, he got on stage at 15. Yeah, when I think about it now, and your mind becomes more realistic yeah. as you get older. Sure. And I think that's insane thinking you're going to make it in show business. That's right. Yeah. So I, I'm sure my parents probably thought me saying I'm going to be in show business right. was so, like yeah. saying I'm going to buy a lottery ticket right. and I'll and win a billion exactly. dollars. Exactly, that's a good. That's a very good uh, analogy. <laughs> oh, and we touched upon Sidney Lumet. Mm. Tell us some of your. He, I mean, a great director, a wonderful director. We talk about him on this show all the time. Do you, Sidney? Yes, yeah. Sidney had a quiet sense of humor, and you know, he was a man of really actors loved him. And he loved us too. He loved all the actors, and he always he always used the stage. You know, every time we did a movie, he put put chalk on us, and we'd go down to the Lithuanian Hall down on down the Lower East Side, and we we, we would act it out like a stage drama. So when he got in front of that camera, he knew we knew exactly what you had to do. But he was also very warm, and uh, I have a wonderful story about him because oh, Al introduced me to him, and he took one look at me, and he said, "Okay, I'm going to use you, down here. Yeah. So I don't know what it was for, but it was for Dog Day Afternoon. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, this is my second movie. And uh, I remember I, I overslept. I think Alex, my son, was playing with the clock. The kid loves mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I'm going now, so to make a short, long story short, I'm half dressed going in a cab going down to Brooklyn. And, uh, and I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get fired. And, and the, the only person on the set was Sydney, And he's waiting for me on, on, by the station wagon. He says, you must have felt like shit, right? When you woke up late this morning, and so, he, so right away he put me at ease. <laughs> That's and great. Just him and I. He said, "It's all right now. We're still working on the lights." And of course, he gave me that one line. I put my whole one line into that. And then he said, "Play, sing, say it right here." And the line is, "Why rob a bank when you got a sucker for a mother?" I would have done any. I would have jumped off a roof. I would have done stunts for him. He's that kind of a guy. Yeah. He didn't, but you know, he didn't say where, where the heck why. He, he just made me laugh, you know. And you turn up in a couple of Lumet pictures in Q and A. No, and then Q and A called yeah. me. He wanted me for uh, Prince of the Cities or something too. He was something. He was thinking about it. Gilbert but, loves that one. Oh it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. The one terrific with, uh, film. Yeah. Uh, and then you played the judge in Night Night Falls on Manhattan. Right. Which so I he also always loved. liked me, and he always believed in. And, and you know, Sydney always looked at the actor in the eye, and, and the actor would have to talk to Sydney. That's the way he auditioned you. He'd, he'd look right in the eye, like I'm looking at you now, and he would say, t- say the lines, Cat, talk to me, talk to me. Okay, you know, we could tell. Well, you look at his films, too, and we talked about this on the show. New York is always a character. I mean, oh, was, yeah. The, the, rare, the rare cases where he was making something like Murder on the Orient Express. Yeah, he was always, like, called the New York director. I would so, say so, probably, yeah, because he, he knew all the actors in New York, you know. But also he, he knew the city. He knew how to film the city. Oh, yeah. So he, he, he was so very talented man. Uh, you know, I don't understand all the technical aspects, but he was, uh, when I saw him later on, he would be looking at this computer and cutting things and making things. And so he knew lenses. I understand that. I read a little bit about his book. He understood lenses and all that stuff. But he un- understood, like Kazan understood actors, he understood if uh, he, would, he would cast you with, with, your, you know, with your face. Uh, with yeah. the outside, but he understood if while you were auditioning, if you were really into the character, he would listen to the voice. It's the voice thing again, you know. And what advice did he give you on acting? And he hints. Oh, never. He never. No. He just made you do it over and over again. He, you know, until he said, "Let's do it. Let's do it." No, he he. Once he cast you, he never gave advice. That's a sign. I don't want to be facetious here, but that's a sign of a great director. And they don't have to give you advice. I mean, they did their job, and they have the patience enough to watch. I mean, you know, he knows you're going to give something. Uh, you know, he would only shoot a scene once or maybe twice because you were so well directed. We went through the process, the physical process of the acting. This, he, all, the, all the blocking was already done on the stage, on the floor, you know. So when you went in front of that camera, you knew what the scene was about. Uh, so, and that's preparation, as you would call. Such a body of work. You look at his films today. 
Yes. Every From 12 Angry Men, which I think was his first feature. one of the greatest movies ever. Look what oh, he did yeah. with that. Everything. Look at the and way he cast it, the way he, he caught the, the expressions on the front of the camera. Movie. Oh, it's a and the stuff. great performances where I was watching The Verdict recently. So I Sidney's mean, a great actor too, Frank. He would have been a great actor. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Stayed. Yeah. Wasn't he an actor? At he the was very an beginning? actor. He was a boy actor. Yeah. Oh, he was yeah. in... Wasn't it the East Side Kids, one of those movies Could where he's a little boy? I think that's right. Who that's, dies in a fire. That sounds familiar. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Yeah. And I think in one of those films, there's a dramatic scene where you see a little boy's face superimposed over a burning building, and it's Sidney Lumet. No yeah. kidding. And, I, never, yeah. I didn't know And he that. worked in early television, too. I think he, I think he oh, was one of sure like Frankenheimer yeah. and those guys. Probably, he was working yeah. in in, yeah. in live TV. He Let me see if I got the, aspects of the chronology of this, uh, uh, Dominic. So you 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 go and you're doing the Gilbert and Sullivan thing. You did a tour of, yeah, of I, Gilbert I, and my Sullivan. First show business, yeah. But, but do I have this right? You went back into bricklaying for a while before you. Yeah, before? because they, because the college was. Uh, a lot of us New York boys from the Bronx and uh, Manhattan, we, we were sent to a state college up in Champlain. We didn't have to pay any kind of, uh, you know, tuition or anything. It was, it was instituted by Governor Dewey of New York. Uh, but then he took it away from us. And uh, in plain English, I got pissed off because I loved being up there. I mean, going to college like that, you know, a kid from the Bronx going mm-hmm. up to seeing the sky for the first time in your life and the stars. And then I was a big man on campus because I could sing. Mm-hmm. And they had me on with these other eight guys doing a cappella songs. I'm casting all these things. And then they take the college away. I wanted to go on Barry Gray's show, but I didn't know how to do it. Wow. I wanted to go on Barry Gray. <laughs> And I actually got online one time, and there was like 40,000 people. I said, I can't do it. But I was so mad. I, I, you know, I'm not an activist type. But I wanted to go and say, why is he taking the college away from us? That was such a beautiful college. And he did. Because the Korean War was starting. They needed the, they needed the place to build barracks for oh, the soldiers. In fact, they had to build more barracks. And guess who the foreman was when they built the more barracks? My father. Oh, wow. Like five years later. Oh, wow. And then, so you talk about, you know, life, yeah. how life goes on like that. But uh, luckily, uh, you know, like I said before, you just keep going on. And uh, I was meant to do, t- I was meant to be an actor. So you went back to the brick lane for a while oh, and then yeah. you started, and oh, then you yeah. started auditioning again. And, and, and Yeah. Do I have that right? Did, late, yeah. Oh, late yeah. 50s? Then I started doing... Uh, well, I got. Then I started. Then I started trying to please my folks. Then I, I met a girl. I married her, and it didn't last. And I kept doing that constantly. <laughs> women were my uh, my drug. Now, not the you, sex. The which, women. Which, <laughs> Interesting. This, this leads you know me. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. This leads me to my other question. When you were a singer in college, did you have a lot of girls throwing themselves at you? No, no. I was not that kind of a kid. No, we went. No. First of all, there were all boys. There were no girls. If there oh. Were, I went to college upstate. They were all boys. Oh, okay. But I always liked women. But I was off women at the time because a girl from the Bronx broke my heart when I was 18. <laughs> and, I, and I stayed away for about two years at least. Two years? I didn't have a date. I wow. remember all the guys saying, come on, I'll take you out on a date. And I took a girl, an Indi- Indian girl, to the Bronx on when, when New Year's Eve. And all the guys hated me because she was dark-skinned. <laughs> they were looking at me like they were going to kill me. Like, <laughs> But Dumma was a gorgeous-looking, uh, in, half Cherokee Indian woman, uh, dark skin though. You know, Alva. You know, she was a, her sister was my my friend up in college. Was his girl. so he made a double date, and I think it was the first time I dated in a year and a half or something like that. So then you got a, over it. Then I was like, yeah, yeah. But women were always uh, someplace I could go. You know, the, the Italian thing. You know, so they, they're going to love you. They're going to they're going to make life a little easier. Right. Right. And distraction. I'm. An, I always said I'm an Italian. I'm an American of Italian distraction. I <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened? So, so then you wound up doing Oliver on Broadway. Yeah, that's all. That's a lot later. That's a lot, a lot later. later. That's I'm a lot. trying to. I'm trying well, to. Not too much later. That's after. Let's see. The Italian went. I went to the Italian. Then I married my Jewish wife. And yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so then you find your, you find yourself the the brick laying is behind you and now so, you're on Broadway. Oh no, so I'm on Broadway. How, how is you know the, why I got on that show? How, the reason I got on yeah. it's the Oliver show. It was. Yeah. Uh, I, I went to the first audition and it was down for me into one other actor. You know what that's like. Yeah. You know, I went to the, I just wanted to get into the chorus, just get into the show. But this was for, an, uh, for the Undertaker, and, and and the other actor got it. And I remember sitting on 44th Street and actually crying 
really felt depressed, sitting on the curb. You can't do that now. You get trampled. <laughs> <laughs> but 44th Street in those days, you know, it was like it was a quiet little street. And I was sitting there feeling so, so terrible. And I, uh, I went home and I, and I remember saying, but the year later, the wonderful stage manager, God bless him, he called me back and he said, Dominic, I'll put you in, the, at least you can be in the chorus, you can understudy the undertake. I said, great, that's great. I just want you to imagine being on Broadway. But the real reason I got in the show, too, is that I had a substitute teacher, teacher license. <laughs> and there's 11 kids in the show. So they really hired me, I think, because I like to take the kids and read, read them dramatic stories, you know. That's funny. Now, you got a big break early on from the, the great George C. Scott. Yeah, George is the one because we worked in a bank together. George and I had worked in a bank in the late 50s, uh, in 1957, 58. And George was, uh, we worked on night shift, midnight to eight in the morning at the Hanover Trust Bank Company. So George, you know, we'd play poker at nights and stuff like that. And he was a sweetheart guy, a nice guy, great guy, tough guy. He made sure that we could smoke. He, he threatened one time. He threatened the supervisor. He said, you let, the, well, you, don't let the, you don't let these actors smoke. And the guy said, you can't smoke. Hey, it's, you can't smoke. In here. You, you, the, the checks are going to get dirty or something. I don't know what the hell he said. And George said, well, I'm not going to knock your teeth out. <laughs> wow. The next, the next day, the next day, we were all smoking. And uh, George was that kind of a guy. But he remembered me when I went, I had to, when I married uh, uh, Merle, when I married Merle. She said, you got to go, to, you got to use your influence, she says to me. She says, why don't you go and ask him for a job? I didn't want to do that. Italians don't do that in the Bronx. We don't, we don't, you got to come to us, right? Frankie understands what I'm, we don't do that. I wish that were true of me, Dominic. Uh, well, that's my nature. I got it. Yeah. And, but Meryl says, go and ask him. So she was doing what with Colleen Dewhurst. I'll never forget it. When I went backstage, she opened the door. This woman, what a face on her. God bless her. You know, she said, what do you want? I said, I, uh, can I talk to George for a minute? As soon as I walked in, Dominic, he said, sit down. What do you want? What can I do for you? He got me on the show. East side, west side. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have any lines, but I played an important part. I came in with the groceries, you know. Now, when you played Fagin, did you, do you remember the accent you did or anything like that? Fagin, I, I copied Robin Ramsey. Yeah. I copied him because he had an Australian accent, which I thought was probably great for the part. Yeah. You know? and he, he did it. He was a great Fagin. In fact, Robin just called me two days ago. I haven't seen him in 50 years. And I found out where he lives in Australia. Some people went to Australia. And he just sent me an email. We're going to get together. Isn't that great? That's great. Yeah. Can, can you do some of Fagin? I know you don't, probably don't remember the dialogue. A man's got a heart, hasn't he? Joking apart, hasn't he? And though I'd be the first one to say that I wasn't a saint, I'm finding it hard to be really as black as they paint. I'm reviewing the situation. Can a fellow be a villain all his life? All the trials and tribulation. I better settle down, get myself a wife, etc., etc. That's great. It's wow. A great, it's a great song, reviewing wow. the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Does Ron Moody play that in the movie? Ron yeah. Moody yeah, did. He just movie. passed away. Yeah, yeah. yeah, right, yeah. It's a wonderful role. But Robin was a 27-year-old fig, and he was wonderful. Uh, now he's about 78, 77. So we're going to get together. Imagine that after all these years. Wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> it is great. Yeah. So, so George C. Scott helps get you He got me on, on that television. television thing, and it, right. got me a, and it got me my first sad card, I guess. And yeah. your first movie, if I have this right, was Fuzz? The yeah, Burt Reynolds Fuzz. and Recco one Welch. line, yeah, uh, yeah. And Jack Weston. Jack Weston. I had the line, can you spare a dime? Something like, brother, can you spare? But it was in the dark in Boston, and you couldn't even see me. <laughs> I didn't even I forgot I was on it one day I turned the television and I hear a voice I say, that sounds familiar that voice and it was me asking him for a quarter or something uh -huh. then I realized how important the voice is in movies I didn't realize that at the time and you were telling us that you had worked on and Justice for All yes. with Al Pacino yes and playing an uncharacteristically evil person was John Forsyth oh, known God. for Bachelor yes. Father yes, and John, yes. And I, and he was like an evil character there, but he yes, he was wonderful as a judge. You hated corrupt him. judge, yeah. You hated him, yeah. You, and, knew, you knew he was a hypocrite. I just watched it last night. Did you? Yeah. yeah. You, you well, get that yeah. great line. I'm not leaving the scene of an accident, I'm in it. 
<laughs> what is the line? I'm, I'm not know. leaving the scene of an accident. You're on the phone yeah. with Pacino. <laughs> oh, that's right. I'm in it. Yeah, that's when right. When you crash your car. Oh, but, oh, yeah, the movie opens with that. Jewison was such a great director. Yeah, Norman's yeah. a great oh, director. Yeah. And, oh, and, and John Forsythe, for people not familiar with his on-camera work, would know him as Charlie the voice of Charlie in Charlie's Angels. Right. right. Well, Both Dynasty. Both the series and the movie. And right. the movie. And right. Dynasty. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, that's, that's right. And Dynasty. But what was what was John Forsythe like? He was a, a gentleman, uh, a really a really kind of a guy that sort of like he becomes your friend immediately. He's that kind of a guy. And, and, he, and after the movie, he actually he took me to the, to the public theater in the limo. And he's let me say, wow. where are you going after the show? After the movie show? I said, well, I, I think I got an audition at the Pap Theater, and I think they're going to use me in uh, Peter Parnell's play. And he said, no problem. He said, come with me. And he took me all the way from, from, the, from the Boston, wherever we did. No, so we came from Savannah on the plane, and from the airport, he, he drove me right to the— he, he was that kind of a guy, and he said, good luck, Dominic. And, uh, and uh, he's that kind of a guy. And I think he really, was also— A generous person. I think he was also a baseball announcer. John Forsythe? Yeah, That's interesting yeah. trivia. I didn't know that. Jack Warden's also good in that film. Oh, Jack Warden's good. Speaking great. of a Lumet actor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah Tell Jack us about fun. Jack Warden. We both love Jack. Jack, I, I love Jack. He was, he was uh, you know, I was just like an extra on the show, so I didn't really get a chance to really talk to him, you know. Not that he, he, he wouldn't have talked to me. I, I just felt I knew my place. I know I wasn't going to talk to him. But he was, uh, he was very nice, easy to work with. Well, Gilbert worked with him, too. And I got a card from this guy, Burt Reynolds. I didn't even know who the hell is Burt Reynolds. Fuzz. Yeah. I said, who's Burt Reynolds? Do I, is a relative? Reynolds doesn't sign a title. <laughs> <laughs> but it was Burt Reynolds. And I, then I realized he's an actor, you know, because I hadn't done that many films. Why did he send you a card? <laughs> To thank you but for it was a, welcome to the show. It was card. It was some kind of a card, like glad to know you or something like uh -huh. that. You must have had, but they were like sent out by an agent or something. Right, it wasn't a right. letter. Or, but, and he was, and Raquel Welch was in it. But I didn't, I hadn't hang around with them because I was just had that one line. You know, I was like, I was in there looking at uh, the suit that uh, that. Uh, what's his name? The, the the actor that was in it, the main the main actor who was in the King and I. Uh, he was in Fuzz. Yul Brenner? Yul Brenner? Yeah. Yul Brenner's in Fuzz? Oh. Yes. Oh, wow, that's he good. He played the guy that they, all the kids, he played the bum. That's good stuff. Yeah, and, Yul and Brenner. So I was in there and I was in, and I saw this, I said, Yul Brenner, where's this? Wow. I saw he, 14 and a half neck. He was a small guy. He wasn't a big guy. <laughs> I always figured he was He'd a always, I, oh, I heard Yul Brenner, I guess it was Magnificent Seven he was in with Steve McQueen. Yeah. And that Yul Brenner would stand on a mound of dirt. Yeah, because he wasn't that tall. And that <laughs> good Steve stuff. McQueen angrily would kick the dirt out <laughs> from, and so he'd keep getting shorter in the scene. <laughs> uh, I'm sure Yul. He's a great actor. That's I read good his stuff. book on acting. He had a book about the, about how he appreciated. He, he believed in a psychological gesture or something like that. Well, he was a he was a great actor. Can we ask you and, about some of the other early roles? Well, how did Raquel well, ahead, Welch go. look? I'm sorry. How did Raquel <laughs> Welch look up close? <laughs> Raquel Welch, she was gorgeous. Good, she was a very really sexy woman. She was a very good looking woman. We'd like to get her for the show. She's for on this our, show for this show. Yeah, she's on our want list. She she was she was, she was having a lot of great stories. I'm sure. What do you, What do you remember about being in all the presidents, man? You played one of the one of the Watergate burglars. Uh, I had a lot of fun, great well, but I was going through a really rough period that time. I was on my third wife by that time, and uh, it was rough. It was really rough. I was very. I went through a lot of anxiety, and uh, I, I I developed a uh, uh, some kind of condition where I was I was getting anxious, and uh, they took me to they took me to the hospital. Uh, they took me to a doctor, and and the director. I was lying on the, on the bed. He said, can't you? And he sent somebody over and said, can't you come and do the last thing I need? I need a, you know? And I, and I felt like saying, go F yourself, but I didn't. You know? <laughs> what about Fort Apache, the Bronx? Uh, that Any was, memories? I had, a, I had a small part, and I played a grandfather who made wine in a cellar. You know? Right, I remember. I didn't meet Paul Newman at the time. I wish I had. I met him later on doing a show, and my teeth fell out. He came backstage, and he said, Dominic, that was a nice comic bitch you had there. My teeth, I <laughs> <laughs> I 
my lower plate flew out. And it was, te- it was, in the, it was te- teetering on the edge of a table, you know. And who comes in? Paul Newman at the end. He says, oh, hey, uh, Dominic, that was a very good bit. <laughs> But that was my time with Paul Newman. You know, it was funny when you said in in uh, all the president's men that right. you were going through a tough period. Yeah, it was very tough. When 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 you're in a movie and you watch it, what the scenes mean to you is, oh God, I remember I oh, was oh, really yeah. depressed that oh, I looked, day. You see, I was thin. I was very 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 very, very depressed. I was going through a very heavy thing with marriage. Very heavy. And thanks God, the beautiful guy like uh, F. Mary Abraham took care of me. He come uh, F. Mary. He was came. He bought my clothes at a hospital, and he, he knew I was going through some stuff. That's a nice and story. Did you yeah, have dealings with here. Dustin Hoffman or Robert Redford? Uh, Redford, I stood there just staring at him. I, I was sitting next to him, but I think, and he was looking. He didn't look at me like he was. He was getting in character, and I was wondering why is he not looking at me. <laughs> 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 I was sitting there, and every sort of wanted to glance at him. But I realized these guys are film actors. They're in. The, they're getting in the zone. They're getting in the zone. You know, I was a stage actor, and I'm a friendly person. But <laughs> you were you were also in an O.J. Simpson movie. <gasps> yeah, well, no, that was a great story. This Sophia is a great Loretta. story. I got to tell you this story right from the beginning. This, this. I, if I were to stand up, I would tell this. Okay. No, <laughs> But the point is, I don't like to diss anybody, so I'm just going to say the director. Okay. Who, he's the villain in the piece, all right? This guy would yell at everybody. He <laughs> he's, yelled a famous, at all, he's a famous director. He was director. in the gambling casino at O.J. Simpson, Sophia Loren, and I was playing, uh, uh, I had no lines. I just had a big 57 Magnum gun, a white jacket, and I was the bodyguard to the- Billy Barty. Billy Barty. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Yep. And that's yep. it. That's it. You know. So so so, and we go to Curacao, and of course I couldn't eat any of the food. I don't even like eggplant parmesan. And they had in Curacao, they had spice. I'm telling you, eat some of that, you burn up from the feet up, right? Your hair stands on end. That's how how spice the food is down there. So I didn't eat anything either. So I'm on the set now, and I'm watching the director <laughs> scream at everybody. He's screaming at all the people, all the extras and everything. That's how he got his thing done, you know? So now I'm in a room now with me, the midget, and Sophia <laughs> Lohan, and the director. Now, right? And there's a photographer, just like Darren is right here with a picture. Yep, just he's like right, Darren is Darren right here. Is in front of a, a, he's sitting in front of a desk. He's crouched down below a desk that the director can't see him because the desk is over here, and he's underneath, right? So I see, this, see, I, so I see him there, and he says, action. And I didn't know much about the full movie business, so I didn't move because I figured if I moved, he's going to be in a thing. I didn't know the difference. And when it's, oh, I meant, and he says to me, go ahead, action, God damn. And then he obviously starts yelling at me and screaming at me. And if I were in the Bronx, I would have probably told him where to go. But I was in Curacao. <laughs> And Sophia Lorenz in the room, and Billy, the, and, and yeah, so between Sophia Lorenz and the midget, no, who's gonna, who, the hell is he, who the hell is he going to yell at? He's going to yell at. He's going to yell at Dominic, right? <laughs> and and, I'm, and and because uh, Sophia was there, and I idolized the woman, you know, and she's also Neapolitan, by the way. Oh, interesting. Uh, uh, you know, I tried to get to talk to her. I had to go to the maid, and I talked to the maid, and everything, but I never got to talk to. her. But she kept looking at me when we came home. She kept like as if to say, you know, I understand what you. But she understood that he was looking at me, and she understood that my, that my Italian was rising up. And but I didn't say anything, and she and she was so sweet to me. She was so nice. I think he's gone. This director, you can talk openly about him. Yeah, I don't want to mention his name. Yeah, okay. I mean, some people. I mean, you got to do what you got to do. But I don't like when people yell at other people. I don't like that. Do you know Gilbert I'm lost a defensive? I'm lost, sorry? Gilbert lost a part to Billy Barty. Yes. No kidding. Oh, come on. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I went up and auditioned for Billy this. Billy was like half your size. <laughs> you, <laughs> you bet. You know, maybe a third. Who's he? <laughs> I don't know the actual name, the clinical name for a person that's small. That's a, I think they, they just call them little persons now. Little persons, yeah. yeah. But yeah. Well, he was a midgets. sweet. He was a nice guy, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> we've had lots of people we've had to work with him. Yeah, I auditioned for that horrible Mel Brooks film, uh-huh. uh, Life Stinks. I didn't see it. Yeah, I don't think anyone did. And I auditioned for it, uh-huh. and everyone was saying, oh, you're great, you're great. Right. And then I found out uh, Billy Barty got the part. <laughs> <laughs> hey, pictures worth a thousand words. Uh, 
but uh, he would. They were both. Yeah, yeah, that was, that's a good story. You didn't meet OJ, huh? Uh, not really. No, yeah. I didn't meet OJ. Yeah. Uh, I, I Thank saw God Coburn. you didn't get him angry. Yeah. <laughs> that movie has some <laughs> cast. Yeah, no, yeah. I didn't meet I, I met Coburn. He was, I didn't meet OJ, I don't think, no. But then, uh, was that the movie we didn't get paid for? I'm trying to think. Wait a <laughs> I did a movie. Oh no, that wasn't the movie. No, Which fingers, movie? fingers. Oh, we, oh, you work for the great James Toback. The, uh, the, the. Uh, oh, that was Jimmy's. The, yeah, is that fingers. The, the one with Kaitel. Probably, probably one of the reasons. Who knows why? Yeah, you did two pictures for him. Yeah. Oh yeah. He, then he, he, when I was at Elaine's one night, Elaine, she called him over and he, she got me. He, he talked me into doing another movie. He's, he's, a, he's a very talented guy. He's a legendary guy. eccentric. Very talented guy, James but Stobeck. I didn't make much money with him. Okay. <laughs> Let me put and it that you way. worked with Harvey Keitel in that. Oh, Keitel was a piano player. Yeah, uh, I, I like that. Yeah, I like and that. Harvey was great. We were we had a nice scene together. And Tony Sirico was in there. I think he had, Tony had a fight with another gangster or something. And it's a nice. And I look back on that. I, uh, it gives a warm feeling. Now that you mentioned Tony Sirico, and we have a perfect segue, we have to ask you about Soprano. Tony. We have to ask you about the Sopranos. Oh, oh, Tony was Tony was Tony. I mean, he was he was always. One time he told me he said, "You know, I'm funnier than you," and I held my tongue because I felt like saying looks on everything, but I didn't say it. You know? <laughs> There's nobody like Tony. Tony's the best. So tell us about get tell us about how how David Chase and the Sopranos came into your life. Uh, well, when I went to the audition, I uh, I remember reading the the audition material, and I'm saying this. This guy's either nuts or he's one, one of the comic geniuses of some old time, or he's writing Greek tragedy. Because I'm talking, I'm talking to my my sister-in-law. And I'm saying we're going to bump off your son. I said, what guy would tell a mother that he's going to kill his son? <laughs> <laughs> what guy? This guy's crazy. Kind of, so I just played it for the real reality, and uh, and he started laughing. I remember he was he, he we gave a real laugh. You know, one of these like. <laughs> That's a real laugh. It isn't one of those producer TV oh, film yeah. Hollywood laugh. <laughs> oh, you're so funny. Get, get rid of that guy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. This was a real laugh. Get rid of that guy. Right? It was a real laugh. It's, well, it's that kind of laugh, yeah. the phony laugh, that you hear during a read-through exactly. on a TV show. Exactly. Yeah. It hits the joke yeah. where it's yeah. like, honey, I'm home, and it's... Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> that is very good. That's exactly I, w- I worked on a terrible sitcom, and the, the, the showrunner asked me to go down and fake laugh for the actors. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a tough job. Yeah, tough job. But this is the issue. This is something I think Gilbert will find interesting about about you and and, and the character of Uncle Junior. Mm-hmm. I saw you say that you would go at home. You would read the dialogue almost as if you were a stand up comic performing in a club. Uh, well, no, when I was shaving, yeah, I'd look in the mirror and I, and I would say, "That's only to get the lines in there, just to uh-huh. get the rhythm." Because some of those lines were tough. They were long jokes. Yeah. you know, you have to get the right rhythm, and and I wanted to get the right inflection. So I would say it like, and I would say it, and then of course I, I would keep a dead, you know, deadpan. You'd had to to get the rhythm. Some of those lines, like if you really want to, that's a long one. So you would say it in the cadence of kind of a Henny Youngman. I would say what? it. Oh, I would never use. I would never use. Yeah. I would just. Yeah, you yeah, may be right. Yeah, yeah. could have been using a Henny Youngman thing or something. Oh, Jack Leonard, who's one of my favorites, because I, oh, yeah. I sincerely hope when you find yourself, you'll be severely disappointed. That kind of thing. Uh, oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> that's, a, that's the kind of stuff. Yeah. That's the kind yeah. of stuff he did. And I we talk about and him Uncle all the Junior time. Uncle Junior is a comic. Very funny. He doesn't character. realize he's funny, right. but he's very, very funny. funny character. When he says it to a cop, the cop he says, "Well, go shit in your hat." You know, right. they all cracked up. Right. And Jimmy used to crack up all the time too. I watched God a clip him. today too when someone when the FBI guy brings you in and he says I want uh, oh, I want yeah. Malanga yeah. and you say I want to fuck Andy Dixon. Oh yeah, Dickinson. yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, I want to fuck Andy Dixon. Who gets lucky first? Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, oh, and tell us about That's the Bronx. That's yeah. I know, I know. Tell us about James Gandolfini. Well, Jimmy was besides being a great actor, was uh, was the kind of a guy you you, you have to love him because uh, he was a uh, generous, generous. Uh, unselfish young human being who really, really appreciated whatever you did, you know. He, he loved everybody. He was, like a, he was like a father to all of us, this young guy. He was 35 years old, and he, he, uh, he, he wanted everybody to be, uh, uh, to be appreciated. And he kept saying, let's be thankful we have this, you know. And he was right. He was very, in, a, in a funny kind of way, he was very spiritual, Jimmy, and very real, and I loved him very much. 
You had worked with him on the on the Lumet picture, but did you guys uh, I really? I didn't work with Jimmy, but I saw him in it. He uh-huh. was there at the reading, and Night, I saw Night him. Falls you on know, and I said, "This guy's a very talented man," and I hardly talked to him. But he was great in that role. You you believed him. What an actor! And uh, his face when we did Sopranos, I did most of my work with Jimmy and uh, and and uh, you know Steve Sharipa and Nancy Marsan. Does and Jimmy always had everything right on right there in his face. You knew exactly what you were saying. I really felt close to him. Uh, that last scene with with you and with Uncle Junior and, and Tony is a heartbreaking scene to watch. Yeah, I saw, when I finally saw it, I, I started crying. And even more heartbreaking now. Oh yeah, in light of his his loss, yeah, he's gone. Is uh, I can't talk to him about him. I cry. Tell me, just this is funny. Tell Gilbert and I about the importance of the glasses to that character, because you uh, said it was an essential Frank, problem. Because the uh, I realized after a while it became a mask. It became my uh, I couldn't I couldn't act I couldn't act Uncle Junior without him. So I so I thought it was a brilliant touch. Uh, if you look at the first scene when I'm with Nancy in the car. I don't have any glasses, and and uh, it didn't look like Uncle Junior. Uh, you know. You know, but once you have those glasses, it made the eyes big, and and it made everybody else look distorted to me, and it really gave me a mask. That's why I could really show the inside of. Uh, it was a wonderful touch. And this, and the actress, I forget her last. Nancy Marchand. Yeah, Nancy, oh, Nancy Marchand. Tell wonderful. us about her. Nancy, you know, we would sit out at the readings every every Thursday or something. We'd sit next to each other, and we we we, we were like brother and sister. We were so immediately, because we're both stage actors, you know, we complete trust. We never had to discuss anything. And uh, Nancy had a look. You know, all she had to do was look. I remember I was sitting in the car, you know, when you, you know, when, the, when you sh- the shoot's over and you're going home, there's always some guy, you know, who wants, wants to talk to all the, all the people who are regulars on the show. And, <laughs> and this guy comes over and he says, hey, remember the neighborhood, Dominic, the pizzeria? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and and, uh, and when he and then he walked out of the car and I said to Nancy, he's he, I know him from the Bronx. She gave me a look like, what do you take him? To, we both could go jump in the lake. <laughs> he's interrupting my thought. You know, he, they, you know you're in the, you're in a car and they don't know enough that you, you you you're trying to do something and he blah 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 blah. You know what I'm talking about. And Nancy gave me a look. I said, wow, that's really she can really look. And she I looked was, at Jimmy. She's absolutely great actress. Yeah, I remember her from Lou Grant. Yeah, great yeah, actor. She did some great work. And wasn't she in? Maybe it was the original one with Rod Steiger, uh, of Marty. Uh, I no, think no. she played the homely girl. You mean the one of uh, not Rod Steiger? Well, you mean, you mean, before Rod's, Borgnine, uh, Steiger did it. Uh, oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Steiger yeah. did it for oh, live television. For live TV. Oh, I didn't know that. It could have yeah. been Nancy. Yeah. yeah, we'll look that up. Our crack research team is looking it up as we speak. And we have to ask Uncle Junior, you know, how you felt about the controversial ending to the series. Well, I always just, because uh, David uh, admitted to us that uh, he, he, knew, he knew the ending before he started writing. He knew he was going to end it that way. So, so me, as, a, as an actor, I always, I always felt uh, the, the, the playwright or the writer had complete uh, can do anything he want I never really judged him on that I, even though I uh, I was surprised at myself at the ending you were surprised by the blackout you didn't see it, you didn't see that coming yeah because yeah. I knew the ending of course but we didn't know the blackout was going to be that long or something he, he, he had, you know everybody thought I thought too that the uh, television went wrong your Aunt Rose ever get over the fact that you were cursing Aunt Rose it was uh, <laughs> you never cursed as a child you never cursed <laughs> You never cursed. <laughs> That's funny. My sister got mad at me because when I fell in the bathtub, I used the C word. She called me up the next day. <laughs> she really got picked up. Then you don't want to listen to this show, Dominic. No. Now, I actually, it was uh, Danny Aiello we right. had on this show. Yeah. And he said the problem he always had okay. with watching Italians in movies right. is the amount of cursing. <laughs> And he said, like, he would never, his family <laughs> they wouldn't let him curse, curse. No, I agree. in front of him. That was the only that. time I, I went to David. I said, David, uh, I went to the writers, uh, Mitchell Green, uh, Mitchell and uh, Burgess and, uh, and Miss Green. And I said, you know, he, he wouldn't curse in front of, uh, in front of uh, Livia. And they said, well, he's very, very angry. So they had to win. They won there. But uh, 
So I had a, you know, in my mind, because they don't curse in front of a woman, you would never curse at that age. And in those days, you never have cursed. Yeah. That's, that's, that's just not done. It's just, it's, you know, only it's, it's poor, it's skivus who would do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Remember that word? That's a good Joy Behar word. Oh, she word. likes to use that oh, word. Joy yours. Skivots. Yeah. Skivots. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a real, like, yeah. dirty. Yeah. You're, you're a yeah. cavon. You're, you're, sure. You're a, you know, you're, you're not a human being. You're, you have no respect. As long as we're talking about Italians and influences, you're a big fan of Jimmy Durante. I love Jimmy Durante. When I was in, when we, when I got the, when we went on the red carpet a couple of, one, one, one Christmas, no, it was election time, I think 2002 or something. Who would you want to vote for president? I said, Jimmy Durante. They didn't like that answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, Jimmy Durante, I wasn't going to tell him, what, what are you, what, none of your business who I'm going to vote for, you know? So instead I said, Jimmy Durante, he's my man. But I would have voted, voted for Jimmy because Jimmy was had great. a big heart. He was great. Can, can you sing like Jimmy Durante? A little bit. I can imitate him just a little bit. Yep. Let's see. You gotta start off each day with a song, even when things go wrong. You gotta start off at what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. He's great. I, tell, I mean, tell, Jimmy's the best. Tell, oh, tell Dominic your Jimmy Durante story. Yeah. I said, like, in Jimmy's later years, Jimmy right. Durante's late, he became a recluse. And Did he they? gave up. He wouldn't talk to people. He wouldn't oh. leave his house. Oh. And so... Uh, my friend found out where he lived right. and went to his house and knocked on the door. And he hears from behind the door, who is it? <laughs> <laughs> and my friend goes, I, I'd like to speak to Jimmy Durante. <laughs> and Jimmy and the voice behind the door goes, he ain't here. <laughs> I love that story. That's a great story. Isn't that the best? Oh, oh, that's a great story. Oh, oh, that's Since a great we're, story. we're going through all the hits of Dominic Chianese here, oh, let's let talk about your, your first love music. And, uh, uh, well, I, it is my first love, you know. You see, Pop didn't want me to play the violin. And that was did not great. want you to play the violin. Why, why not? Well, I, I never knew why. I think it's because if I had the violin, I would, the, the kids would have beat the shit out of him. <laughs> Laughs, but it's true. Funny. My father, oh, that is funny. You, know, you, 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 you go up in the Bronx, you're playing Ring Livio, you, you, you're jumping on Johnny Ring Ride the Olivia. Pony with guys twice your size. My Uncle Joe, you see, my Uncle Joe lined up all the kids one time. It's my Uncle Joe, my father's kid brother. He lined them all up. I was, I couldn't have been more than eight and a half, nine maybe. He says, "Can you beat him up?" And I say, "I don't, I don't know, Uncle Joe." He says, "Can you beat him up?" And then he comes to Victor Dragati, who was built like Frank. He says, "Not me, Frank. Not our the engineer. Frank, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you hear me, Frankie? He's big, big kid. He was a big kid. You know. I said, well, I don't know. He says, well, in the morning you're gonna you're gonna have to fight him tomorrow morning. You meet in the backyard and and and, um, and uh, I'm trying to name it the name of the people next next to the uh, next to the garage. There was a there was the garage. There was a barber shop. There was the candy store. Down down the cellar, that next house across the street from my house, I had to go and fight Victor Dragati. You know, now I I showed up next morning, and Victor's there with his brother, and we we put the fists up, and I weighed about 107 pounds. <laughs> This kid weighed like 150. <laughs> so we start fighting, and, and we, he stops immediately. The brother stops the fight immediately. And it took me like 30 years later. I figured, why the hell did my Uncle Joe do that? He just wanted to see if I was going to show up. Wow. That's it's, it's it. And then I realized it. So then I put to the guy, I said, that's why my father didn't want me to play the violin, because if I had a violin, they would have beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> you were a sissy boy if you played a violin. This is the Bronx, 1937. <laughs> so my father loved me, you know. But I never forgot. That's great. <laughs> but you always sang. I mean, you didn't pick up the guitar till the around guitar 1962. Was 35, think, yeah, because yeah. M- of course Mike Polko, God, God bless him, he he gave me a job as a MC, and That's I right. needed that job because Look, I was I went through my third divorce by that time, and I needed I needed some kind of new family, new place t- to get accepted, certified. I must have been very insecure, but I never went to a psychiatrist, except one time. One time, one day, Michael Moriarty said, Dominic, you maybe you should see, and he gave me a name of some, some stuff, and she, had, she made me take my shoes off, and he said, you got issues, and I never went back. 
Never <laughs> went back. Oh, Never I, went I, back. I, I, so I, this I, is the, I, then I'm doing a show. <laughs> then I'm doing a show at Pacino called Chinese Coffee, right? And in the show, this is the only time I ever saw Al break up. In the show, Pacino says to me, because we're doing this, we're like I'm, his, I'm a mentor to him in the show. He said, uh, did you ever go to a psychiatrist? I said, once. <laughs> <laughs> he said, how long did you go? I said, one. <laughs> and Al, Al gave a look like he knew. He knew my life. He was a very, Al is a, if it weren't for Al, I, you know, I would have never made it. He, he, he was always there for me. He always knew what I was going through. That's nice to hear. And he, he would distract and try to get me some kind of work. He did something, you know. Now he, He's with, a good guy. With Pacino, you hear these stories, same kind of stories you hear about Dustin Hoffman, who you also worked with. I never, I never knew Dustin. I wish I had. That, that both of them could be, like, very difficult or very crazy when they're working. Al is very oh, very uh, very uh, focused. He, he's not difficult. He's focused. Oh. When we started working on China, we only worked, like, four hours a day because the intense of the work. He would drink a little sip of coffee, and then he would have a little more coffee. We'd be <laughs> taking a little sip, but we worked for four hours. It was intense. But, of course, he's very, very focused and very uh, serious. Every little, I remember doing a show with him. Uh, every night you hear the clink of the spoon at the same moment. He was real. He's a real artist. I, I know you would think that he would be, just be improvising. No, he's very. He knows the process. He's one of my favorite actors, and yeah. he can do anything. Yeah, he did, did that great t- he knows the comedy the process, and, yeah. and Dick Tracy. Oh, he's I mean, funny. He could be broad. Al is very funny. He could yeah. be very funny, Al. So let's talk about Folk <laughs> City and a great New York landmark and this job that you got at a, at a difficult time in your life. You were an MC. At this famous New York folk yeah, house. Yeah, I had to, when I had to, when I when I broke up with Merle and uh, I was I had a probably probably I was living with probably had a girlfriend, I was, uh, and uh, so I went to Mike and I said, uh, "Can I be an MC?" And he said, "I never heard of you." He had he was Colombian, he was from Colombia, he had a big accent, and uh, Mike said to me, he said, uh, "You want to." I said, I never heard of Italian folk singer before. I thought, that's what he said. So I said, well, I, thought, I said, Mike, I said, you know, uh, I can sing in Italian. He said, yeah. He said, I said, yeah. I said, I said, I'm an actor. He said, oh, okay. Well, how much you want? I said, $100 a week. He said, I'll give you 90 All right. So, so I see. And every night I would go there and I'd meet all these wonderful people like Sonny Terry, Brownie McGee, Arlo Guthrie. Uh, you know, uh, was Jose Feliciano Dave, there? Um, Jose time? Feliciano. Yeah. That's, a, that's a great story too with Jose, and all these. Oh, and I met all these guys, and I would get there, and I, and I survived on that for a while, for, for a couple of years actually. Meanwhile, all my while, uh, all I wanted to do was go across the street and play Don Quixote, because the, the end to Playhouse was across the street. Wow! And and the stagehands would come in. You know, Jimmy Lynch would come in and say, "You look just like." Richard Cotty was making up to look like you, you know. So I always thought I could play Don Quixote, and I never got a chance. One day, maybe yet, maybe yet. So you were an it. Italian folky, basically. Yeah. Well, not really. I wasn't nope. a folk, but I liked to play. I want. I liked the guitar. Uh huh. But I loved Shenandoah and songs like the right. folk songs and Santo. I, he gave me the job because I sang guitar romana, and I sang in Italian. He said, "Oh, right, that's nice. That's nice." But I, but I knew how to be an MC. I knew how to. You know, to talk to an audience and get them to. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the wonderful Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, and and I would talk to them down in the cellar because Mike had a cellar where everybody would meet, and I would get to know the people. And uh, Jose, Jose Feliciano, one time his wife said to me, she says, "I have to take off tomorrow. Could you take him to the? Could you take Jose out?" I said, "I'd be happy to." And Jose, being blind, of course, and I took him to the place called a scene on 46th Street, which since then burned down. But uh, I took him there, and, and Tiny Tim was there that night playing, and, and I went with Jose, and, uh, and then the producer come over, and they took us to their apartment, and they were passing these funny cigarettes around, and, <laughs> uh, and Jose said, make sure that they don't, make sure that they don't record me, Dominic, okay? I said, sure, Jose, but they gave me his funny cigarette. I went up in the air, scared the living hell out of me, and I fell asleep. I woke up 6 o'clock the next morning, and he, myself and Jose what. Well, I took him to the car, and I never saw him again after that. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> who, who else was at Folk City in those days? I mean, the, I think Dylan did his first professional uh, gig. Uh, Dylan already his made first it famous. I didn't get there until 65, yeah. yeah. So Dylan had already been famous. Uh-huh. Uh, right, he would have been. But Dave Bromberg was there, Sonny Terry Brownie McGee, uh, uh, John Lee Hooker. When I used to introduce him, boy, John he would Lee sit Hooker. down and just get into that groove, you know. 
Uh, so I learned a lot. I learned a lot about performing from these people because it was a very intimate place, and it forced you to be real, you know. So I learned a lot about performing. I also learned that I had an attitude there. One night I, uh, I, had sung, I had sung, Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? And I got tremendous applause, and I was trying to get more money out of Mike, you know, and I had the wrong attitude. Wrong. I didn't go back, and I, I regret that the rest of my life. They were clamoring for me to come back to the stage, and I was pissed off. Big mistake. Ego is a bad thing. Yeah. What kind of things did you sing? I sang uh, yeah, Brother Can You Spend a yeah. Dime, and I did one thing. I do Then I do a little comedy, like I'd say, I can't forget the night I met you. That's all I'm thinking of. You may call it madness, but I call it love. And everybody would crack up, you know. That was like I love a, that. A, a, see, so I enjoyed being People himself. are listening, so they didn't see. That was like a Jerry Lewis. He made a Jerry crazy. Lewis face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it was a crooner, and you, they would, I would get him in a romantic mood and, and make some, I'd make him laugh. I had to earn that hundred bucks a week, you know? yeah. And then I got the, then I got the guitar, and little by little I played thing. And then my mother came down, with my father, my mother kept saying, "There's that girl, she's looking at you." There was a girl there, you know. And uh, we went to Jersey one night, and I was in bed with her, and they hear a knock downstairs. And she said, she gets up, and she says, "Don't move." I said, "What's wrong?" She said, "She said it's my boyfriend." She said, "Don't move." She, <laughs> She said, he's got a gun. <laughs> so I'm sitting in the tent and saying, oh, this son of... So uh, I left finally. And then she came to folks here and she said, I ought to throw acid in your face. Mother. And this is the woman, my mother. See, my mother knew this woman was wrong. Wow. Good story, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Don't move. I'm glad you got the hell out of there. Don't move. And I was waiting. I was looking... Then she came back and said, he's gone. That was a sigh of relief. You never know who you're going to pick up. You know, bad can, attitude. Can Can I put you on the spot and ask you to sing a little bit of Brother Can You Spare a Dime? Sure, yeah. So I use the guitar? Yeah, why not? Now, this is a wonderful song. You know, was the, the word, you know who wrote the words to this was uh, uh, Yip Harburg. Oh, Yip Harbor. Yeah, also over the did, rainbow. Over the rainbow. Yeah. Once I built a railroad, I made it run. I made it race against time. Once I built a railroad, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? Once I built a tower to the sun Brick and rivet and lime Once I built a tower Now it's done Brother, can you spare a dime? Once in khaki suits, gee, we look swell Full of that Yankee doodle dum. Half a million boots went slogging through hell I was a kid with a drum Say, don't you remember They called me Al it was out all the time Say, don't you remember I'm your pal Brother, can you spare a dime? Fantastic! That was a treat. Yeah, Parberg wrote those lyrics. Thank you, yeah, Dominic. That was, that was one of the, the great songs to come out of the Depression. Exactly. Wonderful. Yeah. 
And I remember the Depression, you know, back in the 30s. You know, my sister and I would put little nickels and pennies in the paper and throw it down a fire escape because there'd always be somebody down in the buildings in the Bronx. You know, there were trumpeters and guys with accordions trying to earn a living. You know, they, they didn't beg. They just sang. They tried to make that. That nickel bought them, you know, got them a cup of coffee at least, probably a sandwich in those days. So I remember the, the Depression and... and, and how, Tell us about uh, tell us about your your CDs, Dominic. You have two CDs, one called Hits and Ungrateful Heart. Yeah, the, uh, Mike, uh, front, my friend of ours, Vinnie Pastore, said D- D- Dominic, uh, we were we were doing Soprano. He said, "My friend Mike's making a movie. He said, do my favor, do me a favor. Let's go do it." I, I saw it. So the movie was called Hell's Hell's Kitchen, or not Hell's Kitchen, but uh, Hell's uh, the, the, about the river up on the East River there. On the Hellgate Bridge, and uh, we were, and we had a. He said, "We're going to go to the Nashville Film Festival." I said, "Gee, Nashville Film Festival! Wow!" I heard of Cannes, and I heard of all these. I never heard of a Nashville Film Festival. So we go down to Nashville, and uh, while I was there, Benny, um, Frankie Vincent, and I went to the BMI uh, event, and uh, I get bored at those things. So, I, and, but there was a guy with a guitar and a. Uh, and a girl with a drum. And I said, Frankie, let's ask if we could borrow this thing. This is how I happened to make a recording. So, and I, and I sang a country song. I sang, uh, uh, it's a wonderful, it's a, it's, it's a real country, real like a honky-tonk guy about a guy who's drunk. And, uh, and I found out, I get a call in New York. When I went back to New York, I get a call from this guy, Dub Cornette. And Dub says, was that you singing Uncle Junior? I said, yeah. He said, <laughs> he said would you like to make a record? So I'm going down to Nashville and we made a record, uh, the hits. We did the whole thing in one day, frankly. That's one day, great. a little bit. And, all the, and these, those musicians down there were great. And then even after that, uh, uh, he, he, Dub's wife was working for the Grand Ole Opry. And uh, I had a chance to go on the Opry. And, and I sang an Italian song, Frankie, I'm telling you. When I left that stage, and I was crying. Oh yeah, I read. They really I, appreciated. It. I sang an Italian song that my grandfather taught me. It's "Star Vigina Me," you know, "Star Vigina Me," and I and I told him what the words meant. And these people were so nice. So I want to go back. It was touching to read about that. How you 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 got so emotional being on stage oh, at the Grand Ole Opry. Little Jimmy Dickens said, "You she welcomed me to uh, to the stage. Welcome, Dominique. To, welcome to the <laughs> Grand Ole Opry." <laughs> I said, thank you, James. So when he came to New York about 10 years later, you know, he, was at, he was at Carnegie Hall. Uh, I said to one of the guys, I said, you know me? He said, yeah, you're John Junior. I said, could you let me backstage, please? I wanted to go and welcome to. So I said, welcome to New York, Jimmy. <laughs> he didn't remember me at all. <laughs> but, but it was a great moment. You know? He had his diamond jackets yeah. and everything. I think he, he just passed away, too. He just too. passed away yeah. a couple of years yeah. ago. What a lovely man. Yeah, great talent. He made talent. me feel at home. And uh, Charlie Pride was there that night, and uh, and Mickey Katz, not Katz, Mickey, what's his Mickey's last name? I'm trying to think of his name. He's a some wonderful guy, Mickey, Ra- Mickey Raphael. Uh-huh. Mickey was playing. He plays for Willie uh, for Willie Nelson, you know. Some, you know, and he was saying that you had a you had a black guy, had a Jew and Italian at the, at, at that at that one well, we on a one on one night. That's kind of nice, you know. <laughs> You're making me think of the old Lone Star Cafe. Yeah. You, you it was see an those. ethnic night that night. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go back. I want to go back because the people down there are great. You want to go back to the Opry? Yes. Yeah. They're, 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 these people are great. So the other night I ran into uh, to, uh, Billy Paul Jones. Uh, yeah, Billy Paul Jones. You know, you can tell that name. He's from Nashville, you know. And, I met, and he got me a ticket into to go and see the Carnegie Hall, Ricky Skaggs, Ry Cooter, the White Sisters, all these great, you know. So I think I'm going to go back. Great. I think they're going to get me. I want to go back because I wrote a song. You want to hear the song? Yeah. Yes. All right. By all means. On the air. <laughs> On the air. Okay. Frankie, get this song. It's a great song I wrote. It's called Late Bloomer. Some people are late learners, candles on both ends burners, never really see the morning sunrise. Time's a way of teaching, life's a way of preaching, brings a share of wisdom to the wise guys. Take time to smell the flowers, don't worry about the hours you're spending or what the time will cost. We all know time is money, but let me tell you, Sonny, when that sun goes down, the time is lost. 
Better to be a late bloomer in the rose garden Than never to have bloomed at all Now I wake up singing when I hear those church bells ringing Calling me to kneel right down and pray Good Lord, I'm only human I hope that I'll be blooming Thank you for the sunshine every day Everybody Better to be a late bloomer in the rose garden Than never to have bloomed at all Oh, it's better to be a late bloomer in the rose garden Never, 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 never to have bloomed at all Fantastic So I want to go down and sing that in Nashville That's wonderful Thank you for the opportunity to do that on the radio yet. <laughs> and speaking of being a late bloomer. I am a late bloomer, yeah. Yeah, and you got the part of your life Amen. time at 68. 68 years old, yeah. yeah. And now tell, just to share, before we run off, share, sure. share with Gilbert what you said what about, said? about your, I found this, I found this fun and profound. You said, uh, it, I don't want to steal, steal the thunder, but it was something about a famous actor from Gunga Din. From Gunga Din? Yeah. Or Dr. Kildare? Hmm. Sam Jaffe? Oh, they said I was I looked like Sam Jaffe. No, you said if I have this quote correct, you said you wanted to be you wanted to be the next Sam Jaffe. Oh yes, that's right. Yeah, because <laughs> so, there used to be uh, phone calls in New York. You know, we used to have operators. They they, 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 they were they take messages for you. I forget the name of the you know, the great ones. You know, back in the sixties and fifties. And one of them, I remember, I walked in one day and I said, "Look, he's a young Sam Jaffe." You know. Then I looked at him. I said, "Yeah, Sam Jaffe. That's a great actor. I want to be that kind of a character actor." Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, he was one of my idols. But I also loved Paul Muni, and I loved, uh, uh, you know, I, I was always uh, inv- involved with great actors: Edward G. Robinson, Dick Cagney, all, all these guys. Uh, you know, Claude Rains. He was one of my favorites. We lo- we just talked about him. Yeah, the the, the guys that were quiet, that could, that could be quietly villain. I loved that kind of stuff. And I, but I never thought I'd be a movie actor, to be honest with you. I mean, it wasn't, um, maybe subconsciously I thought, but never consciously aware that I was in, I'd be in a movie. I just loved the stage. I, I'm basically an entertainer. That's what I put on my IRS form. My tax form. I'm an entertainer. I heard a Sam Jaffe story. <laughs> Sam Jaffe. Yeah. Where a, a friend of mine's father was in a restaurant and he was at the urinal and next to him was Sam Jaffe. <laughs> and so he he wanted to talk to him, but he knew he couldn't. So he walked away. And then later on that evening, he went up to him before Sam Jaffe left, And he said, I just want to tell you, uh, Mr. Jaffe, I'm, I'm a big fan of yours. And he said, thank you. And thank you for waiting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, that's beautiful. Oh, so great. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So I guess... I'm out of cards. Yeah. I think we covered the uh, the career of Dominic okay. uh, Chianese. Well, first... Yo, go ahead. Now, you have a charity. Yeah. Oh, yes. Joy Through Art Charity. I only wish the room were big enough on Sundays for, for the whole United States of America to come into the room and see what happens. We put all the wheelchairs against the wall, and, we, and I create a theatrical space that way. And in that magic circle, uh, like why I say I'm an entertainer. I get everybody to have a good time. And we, and we spent for two hours. In retirement people, homes. We, we, yeah. we, we sing to each other. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and my charities and my, uh, if I even may say, my legacy is going to be I want to teach. My father, in, 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 it was right. I, mean, I am a teacher. He always wanted me to be a teacher. And I did teach. We didn't talk about my teaching experience. But uh, but I was a teacher for a while. And I loved, I loved teaching. I want to teach. It's sort of like the tumblers of the, of, the, of the Catskill days, the guys that made everybody have a good time. I have a talent for that. I can get everybody to have a good time because, the, the, because you loosen everybody up. You know their names. I'm good at names. And everybody has a good time. And so we have people... I'll leave her off with telling you about Annie, the little Irish lady with space between her teeth. And, and she's cute. She, she says, and she has Alzheimer's, 100% Alzheimer's. I said, I said, Annie, what do you like to sing? She said, would you sing when Irish eyes are smiling? So I hit the D chord. And she has a great ear, and she, and she keeps moving her fingers, you know, like this. 
There's a tear in your eye. When, and she says every word perfectly. When I eat a shy, she's smiling. And she does it. And she has complete Alzheimer's. And of course, during the course of the afternoon, she'll, she'll ask again. She would just sing. She forgot that she had done it. And she does it so well. And she moves her fingers like in perfect timing for the whole two hours. And about a year ago, because we've been, we've been together now about seven years, every Sunday, I said, Annie, you must have been a wonderful pianist. She says, oh, no, I was a typist. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. That's what the charity is all about. Joy about Through Art. People. Joy Through Art Foundation, 1441 Broadway. Uh, uh, yeah. And you won the Ellis Island Medal of Honor for your charity work. That was a real point out. Yeah, so congratulations. And I was the last one to speak. You know, they put me up last. And you know what I did? I sang, I sang, God bless them. I sang uh, America the Beautiful. Because everybody was talking for so long. I went up there and I said, my grandfather, my, his spirit came and said, just sing. You know? And I sang, and everybody stood up and it was a wonderful, it was a wonderful day. To know that grandpa came from Naples in 1904. He's 22 years old, right? And uh, do you have anything else to plug? Yeah, anything else yeah. coming up, Dominic? I'm going to uh, just pray that I get down to Nashville and sing my new song. Okay. I, 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 I want to write songs now, and I'm starting to write things now for, the, for my fellow friars. I want to write comedy. I want to write skits. I, you know, it's because you know, I've always felt that. You know what writing is like. You know how tough it is. But I, I feel I have a talent there. My daughter, Rebecca, is a great writer. Uh, it goes through the genes. Oh, aren't you working on a on a musical about your life with your daughter? Yeah, she was. She's starting to do that. Uh, she's. I think she's finishing fine. But you can't push that kind of process. Mm -hmm. It may take years. You know. Right. It's already been a year and a half. But uh, I do love the stage. I love for, for its value. We went to see Lulu at the Met last night. Well, it was a great show. Completely different kind of show. You know. Uh, it was. It was it's and people. That's when people get together and they, and and then we realize that we're all we're all we're all human, and that's why I love. So I can't thank you enough, Gilbert. Thank you for having me on your show, and Frank. Thank you so of much. Of course, I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Guys. We've been entertained within an inch of our lives. Yeah, <laughs> and I love thank it. you. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed this. As I wrap the show up, yes, I'm going to ask you one more thing. Sure. After I'm through. I want you to sing the most saddest, most sentimental Italian song you could think okay, of. Okay, I can do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he loves uh, the Italian songs, yes. Yes. Dominic. Yes. I, I'm Gilbert Gottfried. This has been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre. Once again, we're at Nutmeg Studios. Thank you, Frank. With Frank Verderosa. And we have been talking to both uh, Uncle Junior and, more importantly, Johnny Ola. <laughs> <laughs> and let me see if I don't fuck up your name here. Uh, <laughs> Dominic Chianzani. Wow, Dominic. I said it. Not even close. Jo Dominic. Menu, right? Dominic. <laughs> Dominic <laughs> Key. Key, Take us to Chaz Palminteri in the restaurant. <laughs> Chaz Palminteri. Was Chaz Palminteri? I love it. That's beautiful, Gilbert. But Dominic what? Kianese. Uh, Kianese. You were close. Dominic <laughs> Kianese. You were close. I knew, I knew I would fuck it up. No, no you were very end. close. Like a trolley I... car with a 747 airplane. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Thanks, Dominic. Now, I I want, I want a, a totally... Unselfconsciously sentimental, uh, tear jerking Italian number. Well, that would be Grandpa's song, it would be Santa Lucia Lundana. Yes. That's a beautiful song. Okay. Yeah. Want to do it now? Yes. Sure. Take us out. Oh, yes, that's right. Grandpa would sit by the window in the Bronx, <laughs> smoking those wonderful De Nobili cigars, <laughs> which is such an ironic name, isn't it? The song is about Neapolitans coming to the New World in 1904. They're coming to make a living and build a family. And as they're leaving Naples, they become, they realize that they're going to a new world and may never come back home again.
Partire noi bastimente per terra salontano, quando un bordo sono napoletano, quando una petra mente, a giù a golfo già scombare, e a luna mezzo mare non può che nabile le va a vedere. Sandalogi lontana de quando a malingoni se gire munza se va a cerca fortuna ma quando è sponda luna non da ne nabile non sa posta Santa Lucia tu tieni solo un poco mare ma più lontano stai e più belle pare canta una petra mente canta una nessirene che adesso ancora rezza un cuore e cuore che c'è si è nato in Napoli che va a morire Santa Lucia lontana di quando a malingonire se gira una sana se va a cerca fortuna ma quando sponda l'una l'onda ne nabile non sa questa santa luce l'onda ne de quando malingoni Fantastic. Thank you. Now I'd like to say your name again, <laughs> but I'm afraid I'll fuck it up. Can you just say your name? You got to say it right. You know why? Because Charlie Rapp once said to me, Dominic, would you like to be a singer at the Catskills? I was 21 years old. I said, yes, Mr. Rapp. And he said, would you change your name? <laughs> And I couldn't do it. Dominic. Do you know the words? I don't know why it's making me think of this. Just because you could sing so sentimentally. Do you know the words to my Yiddish mama? I know a couple of words. Oh, can you? Can I hear some of that? I would love to. No, I don't know it in Yiddish. Though. I got to learn. Yeah, I, no, I, I, no, in time. English. I, I don't know. <laughs> I long to see you now My Yiddish mama Mr. Mazo used to teach me How to add numbers on the paper bag Mr. Brenner, he gave me My first egg cream <laughs> Mrs. Freeman, she gave me A three-quarter violin In the Bronx <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, buddy Well, you made me cry in two different languages <laughs> 